I'm Laura Ryder. I am the head dog trainer at Morley Vet Centre here in sunny Perth uh, and am also part of the education team for Institute of Modern Dog Trainers here in Australia. Uh, I am also on the Fear Free Speakers Bureau uh, and uh, was fortunate enough to be given the opportunity um, to spend some time asking some questions to Dr. Marty Becker, who is the founder of Fear Free. Uh, so we decided we would do a pre-recording um, purely because time zones, whether it be in Australia, all over America, in the UK, it just wasn't going to work. Uh, so we've done a pre-recording. Um, I did a shout out, got some really great questions that I put forward to Dr. Marty Becker. Uh, he also asked his daughter, uh, Mikkel Becker, who is a dog trainer uh, and is super experienced and has lots of knowledge um, to join in the conversation. Um, so I hope that this will give you some ideas about Fear Free, um, whether you are a fellow dog trainer, working in veterinary industry um, or other pet professionals, um, I hope that you enjoy. Thanks for watching. Video and probably think it's one of uh, America's top male models, senior models, but actually I'm Dr. Marty Becker, I'm a veterinarian and I'm coming to you from our almost heaven ranch in extreme northern Idaho. I got pets I can see out the window. I've got pets beside me here on the chair. And we're blessed up here in the wilderness to not only have our dogs and our cats and our horses and our fish, but also abundant wildlife. I'm what you would call a veteran vet, a veteran veterinarian. I've been in practice for over 40 years. I wanted to be a veterinarian from the time I was six years old and was able to get into veterinary school early and graduated in 1980 and was always privy and partner to the human-animal bond. I went to veterinary school to be a dairy practitioner. The dean gave this incredible talk on the human-animal bond, and next thing I know, I'm up front the first hour of the first day of veterinary school volunteering for the People Pet Partnership that matched elderly people with homeless pets. And then also had a lot of, of interest in education in the human-animal a health connection or the healing power of pets and it's funny how things happen i went to always wanted to be a veterinarian but upon graduation the human animal bond led me to write chicken soup for the pet lover's soul that led to going on uh, good morning america where i remained for 17 years and then that led to a syndicated column and all these years later as i've i've been on network tv in some form for over 25 years had a syndicated column for 20 years a nasty syndicated column 25 books, uh, five of which I've co-authored with my daughter, Mikkel, who you hear from in a minute. And I was, you know, besides this human-animal bond and doing media and really traveling all over the globe, lecturing to veterinarians and, and pet health professionals about, about the human-animal bond, about the healing power of pets, about how to run a successful business. But Ten years ago, in October of 2009, I was in a conference up in Canada and listened to a board of veterinary behaviorists talk about fear. And in her talking about fear, it was one of these, one of these lectures you leave transformed. You don't leave the same way you walked in the room. She, her name is Karen Overall, and she talked about the development of maladaptive fear, how fear is caused by something painful or something disturbing. She drew a parallel to the human healthcare system of the 50s and 60s. And this is all, I'll leave with this. So basically, Back when I grew up as a child, you're taken against your will for health care, which is still true today. Uh, a one-year-old child, a two-year-old child is taken against their will for health care. But back then, it was brutal. I mean, we were manhandled, manipulated, threatened, and abused. I can remember three people holding me down to lance an abscess on the end of my index finger, very sensitive part of your body. I remember wailing after getting an in injection of antibiotics in the, the butt cheek and my mom standing up rather than to comfort me, raising her hand up, shut up, Marty, don't embarrass the doctor. I remember my sister Cheryl getting her ponytail pulled to keep her mouth open at the dentist like a human Pez dispenser. Well, those things all get stored in the amygdala, that little almond shaped thing deep in the brain that stores all these negative memories. Not sure how something that small can hold all these memories, but uh, it does. And so she re you realize every animal, not just dogs and cats, but every animal is about the equivalent of a one-year-old child. They never know why a procedure benefits them and they can't anticipate or expect the relief of fear, anxiety, and stress or pain, even if it's moments away. So 
that led 10 years ago to the, the spark that uh, it kind of Fear Free was born in an instant, took 10 years to develop and has been an overnight success. And it's amazing to see it spread across the globe, uh, veterinarians in 46 countries and embracing all aspects of, of pet care. And Mikkel, before you introduce yourself, uh, you'll be grossed out to know I'm sleeping in your bedroom right now because I'm, I've suffered from depression, which I'm very open about. And I went on a different dosage of antidepressant and I'm having these lucid, crazy dreams where I can literally do an aerials in bed and crazy and your poor mom can't sleep. So up in your bedroom, I see all your belt buckles and ribbons from your horse days, which always make me smile. Oh, well, I love being able to grow up um, really up in Northern Idaho, up at almost having a ranch with my family and having my dad for a vet was definitely a really neat experience. And dad was really good about always letting me have that time with horses and they were not cheap. Uh, my dad always said, uh, they may, I pay, was kind of his, his slogan. And um, really for me, uh, animals have always, they've always been just such a love in my life. And I went to school for broadcast journalism and I was about three credits away from graduating in that. And I realized, you know, I just don't have a, a big passion for this. And, and actually, uh, the, the main reason why I ended up switching careers actually came down to uh, meeting with my dad used to be on Good Morning America. And uh, Diane Sawyer was my hero. She was my role model. Like, uh, so I put in my yearbook that I wanted to be. And I, I have, still have the shirt in my room that says the next Diane Sawyer that she signed for me. And, um, but it was the 30th anniversary of Good Morning America and um, a bunch of different people from the show and different stars were in there. And I just felt like, wow, it's just such a, a crazy thing to be able to go in there right out of high school and, you know, just in college. And, um, but Diane Sawyer walked in and this is right after she had signed that shirt for me. And uh, she just came right up to dad and I right away and she said, Mikkel, I, I, you really need to rethink your career. She's like, you just are too nice for this. It's, it's dog eat dog, it's really cutthroat. Like you find something else, find a different passion, find something um, that's more you know, aligned with like who you are as a person. I just don't want this for you. And so it was really a hard message to take, especially from this lady who, I mean, literally my hero. Uh, but what was really neat about that is after graduating in communications, my dad uh, really opened up to me about how I could, you know, expand my love of animals and do that for a career and really combine it with communication. So I'm just so grateful. I feel so blessed to be able to have a career where I get to work with animals. I get to reach people through video and through articles about pet training and uh, different behavior issues that people have. and really my, my passion is working with veterinary professionals and also with, uh, with trainers and being able to combine the two. I think some, so many times there's such a separation between that when really it needs to be far more cohesive and to have that better communication. And by doing that, we better serve the pets. And that's my big passion through Fear Free is to be able to unite both veterinary professionals and training professionals, as well as groomers and other pet professionals to make it a more cohesive match and to make it emotionally protected for the pet wherever they're at, from the home to the veterinary hospital, to grooming, to training, and just ensuring that that pet is just really has this bubble wrap of emotional safety around them wherever they go. And, and that's what we want to talk with you about through Fear Free. Excellent. Thank you both. Marty, could you please give a brief overview of the Fear Free certification programs and any new updates as of uh, today, which is March 5th, March 6th, 2020? Oh, I think you're on mute. By the way, for anybody that's going to be watching this video, I apologize for those two homely dogs that my daughter has. It's just like uh, we can always put bars over their eyes or something or blur them out. And actually, they're so funny what they want your attention, Mikkel. And I think anybody that's going to be watching this can identify with the thing that there's only one greatest pet in the world and, and every family has him or her. So I feel the same way about my cutie pie as you do about that Indi Indiana bones. <laughs> Unbelievable. 
uh, he just, the way he looks at you, is, he's the one in the back, by the way. So F Fear Free started out just uh, the right thing to do is to match up with a veterinary oath to prevent or relieve animal pain and suffering. We soon found out it was better medicine. We found out that there was dramatically fewer injuries because you weren't getting fear-based aggression. It was more profitable, it was more fun, basically all things positive about it. But people pointed out, what good is it to have a dog that loves to go to the vet or a cat that's neutral to positive and have a lousy home life? So we created Fear Free Happy Homes and that is free to all pet parents, pet guardians globally. And then we created fearfreeshelters.com and that is designed to to go to the shelter community. And that thing has taken off like uh, crazy, like prairie wildfires. I'll go, go over the numbers in a minute. And then we looked at, you know, our, our mission is to prevent or relieve uh, fear, anxiety, and stress in pets by inspiring and education, educating the people who care for them. That's you, that's trainers, that's groomers, that's boarding, that's daycare, that's dog walking. That's veterinarians, that's shelters, that's behaviorists, uh, everybody. And Mikkel mentioned, really, we have a 360 degree view, an ecosystem management, bubble wrap around pets' emotional well-being in all aspects of their life. And so the veterinary professional at, at fearfreepets.com, we have a, you know, primarily for dogs and cats, avian track is coming up and we're working on the equine course. It should be done later this year, early next year. Following that will be uh, dairy, research, wildlife. You know, over time we'll, we'll go right through the species to where we look at the emotional well-being of all animals. So right now and under Fear Free Professionals, uh, veterinarians and veterinary nurses primarily, we have uh, about 45,000 certified. There's about 75,000 that have registered for certification. As far as the dog trainers, you know, we got an upcoming course uh, partnering with veterinary professionals and there's a nail trimming course that maybe Mikkel can talk about later that was so popular when they launched it, it, it crashed our site for a while. There's 680 certified trainers. Upcoming courses for groomers are simple behaviors to help groomers pass to a great bath, uh, bath business and marketing, and again, that nail trimming course, there's 331 certified. The shelter workers is taken off like wildfires. I probably shouldn't use that uh, with what all's happened in Australia, which just know we had a lot of prayers and, and other support that we sent to you during that time. But there's 14,500 members with over 50% of those having completed a free five hour course. Uh, that's extraordinary. And there's a bunch of things happening where that is that is going to spread virally through shelters and animal rescue groups, of which there's 33,000 uh, of those in the U.S. And so Fear Free Happy Homes. Oh, I got something mixed up there, by the way. Shelters is 10,428. Uh, and we're adding new modules. Fear Free Happy Homes has 14,500 members. But there's 1,000 to 2,000 people a day that access that uh, that are non-subscribers. Mikkel, do you want to add anything about the nail trim course? Sure. So uh, I was going <laughs> to... Sorry about that. I, I'm distracted by my own dogs. I think that <laughs> dog hair is just flying around. It's like snow in here. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so I finished the nail trim course, which was so exciting. I think nail trims of all the procedures that happen in the home, at the at the groomer, nail trims are definitely the biggest source of stress, not only for the pet, but also for people. And I think that so many times it's just such a, a burden that it's one of those things that people want to hand off. And it doesn't have to be that way though. And through the nail course, what we really did is we looked at different ways that you can reduce the fear, anxiety, and stress of the nail trim. So looking at different tools that you might use, different tips and techniques to desensitize and to uh, counter condition the dog to that type of tool, um, different cooperative care behaviors that they can do. And that's something we're actually going to be expanding upon in our, our next module for the nail trim course. So 
uh, because it was so well received, we are going to, going to be looking at other ways to really advance and, and to go beyond that. So we do touch on things like dogs being able to use a scratch pad. And uh, it was fun. I, I was able to teach my dad's dog, Cutie, to use the scratch pad for both his front paws, uh, which is really important for him because he really is adverse to nail trims. Um, and also for his back paw, so being able to file down his own nails. And so the more that animals can cooperate and participate willingly in their care, the better. And so through the nail course and through the training course and all of the different certification courses we have, there are a lot of ways to approach a situation of care and to reduce the fear, anxiety, and stress that we experience. Mikkel, <laughs> you, you, are, uh, you are unlucky in love with men. But anybody watching this, if you saw this dog, he just stares at you like, I just love you. Why can't you find a man that loves you like this dog? And by the way, describe that the dog in your arms there has been rehomed five times. And so you might talk a little bit about uh, so actually, your other love. This is Otis. This is um, uh, my daughter, Reagan. She's 10. She says, I have to call him my grandchild because he, she's his mom. Um, but he is our little rescue from Arizona Pug Rescue, and he has he has definitely been full of his own little shenanigans. And actually, we are going to be having a, a course on Fear Free Happy Homes on a, kind of a problem lab series. And uh, the reason for that is I think so many times as uh, pet owners get really really frustrated when they deal with behavior issues with their dogs and with their cats and all of their animals and. And it feels like, gosh, my, you know, this is so frustrating. I feel so alone. It can feel really isolating. And um, through that series, it's not only just offering um, tips for being able to work through issues in a way that's um, humane and in a way that's kind and, and reward-based training, um, but really focused and also with management. Uh, but it's also just being able to relate with people that, hey, this is, you know, we all deal with different things with our pets and there are ways that you can manage it and different ways you can address it. You don't have to go to more punitive measures in order to do that. And, uh, it, you know, it's it's so interesting how sometimes, actually, I feel like a lot of times for, for most dog trainers, you get into the field because you deal with a problem dog. And my first dog, Scooter, or wire-haired fox terrier, was really that dog for me that got me into dog training in the first place from a very early age because she was extremely reactive and aggressive with other dogs, would run away all the time. It was, you know, she, she really put me through the ringer from, from an early age. And, um, and Otis has been such a good dog in so many ways, but definitely has his share of challenges. So uh, that's something that's going to be coming up is his own series and, and ways that we've been helping him. Uh, because literally, when I first got him, this would not have been him. He would have been barking pretty much incessantly. So it's pretty neat how far he's come. Well, Mikkel, one thing you didn't get a chance to really uh, talk about yourself too. You co-authored five books and you've got, you might talk a little bit, you're the featured trainer for, for uh, Fear Free. You might talk a little bit about your credentials other than co-authoring five books. Yeah, so, um, so I was able to go through the Karen Pryor Academy and the Dog Training Academy uh, with Dean Donaldson. I was able to get my... Um, my certified professional dog trainer, knowledge assess, and as well as my um, behavior consultant through uh, a C C P D T A P D T, and also um, through IAABC. I am a certified dog behavior consultant through them as well, and a certified Karen Pryor uh, trainer, training academy uh, graduate from there as well. And I think that those, oh, and also went through the Purdue course with Dr. Andrew Lusher and Julie Shaw, and and really my, my main focus since graduating has been really working with veterinary professionals, working alongside my dad. And we just co-authored a book called From Fearful to Fear Free. And it's all about different ways to help dogs, both preventively and if an issue already has arisen on how to help them deal with different stressors in their life and, and ways that, that you can tackle it in a, in a humane way. So, Mikkel, I'm going to talk about the uh, the FAS scale and concerted approach and general control and the touch gradient. I'm up here on, on our horse ranch in northern Idaho where the internet connection is not as good as yours. So I might introduce this and then have you talk about those pieces. But I, I do want to tell the people that are going to be listening to this that uh, it's amazing. There's 30 veterinary schools in the United States, and of the 30 veterinary schools, 
22 require fear free certification of all students now. And fear free is free to all veterinary students, faculty and staff, free to all veterinary technician or nursing students, faculty and staff globally. So anybody out there that's in educa getting educated as a veterinarian or a veterinary technician or nurse, it's free to you and everyone else that's in the schools. And there's a textbook for the veterinary technician. We actually worked with them to change restraint to our gradient touch, our touch gradient gentle control considered approach and our FAS scale and working with the AVMA to change what's required of technicians to be taught. So, you know, restraint was designed to protect, you know, positional compliance designed to protect people. And the things that we do are positional, uh, uh, po uh, positioning them but designed to protect the pet and ours is better restraint more injuries with our things let fewer injuries because you don't see the fear-based aggression so Mikkel can you go through considered approach gentle control and the touch gradient absolutely so I, I want to make sure to have our official definition and then I'll expand upon it so a concerted approach it encompasses the interaction between the veterinary team and the patient and any inputs from the environment when veterinary care is being administered. And so any inputs that can include inputs from the patient themselves, from their physical environment, from the client, and from the, the veterinary team that could create fear, anxiety, and stress, or what we call FAS for short. And really the goal of both considered approach and gentle control, which we'll talk about in a moment, which is positioning the patient for care, is to prevent and to reduce any fear, anxiety, and stress that the pet may experience. So when we look at considered approach, it, there are so many factors we really want to look at. And it's actually looking at reducing fear, anxiety, and stress before the pet even goes into the exam room, before there are even hands on the patient. So this can be things like changing the way, the layout of the veterinary hospital. So a lot of times in a traditional veterinary hospital, it is just a stew pot of stress when you go in the waiting room. There are, a lot of times people are kind of around the edges, the pets are, are close to each other, directly facing each other. The cats may be kind of right down there on the ground in their carrier, exposed to the incoming dogs and other cats and foot traffic. And for a lot of dogs are extremely reactive. I know that we have a lot of trainers in the audience and I, if it's anything like it is for me, uh, reactivity is definitely one of the biggest issues that, that most dogs, not most dogs, but a lot of my clients face. And so this is just really kind of putting them in the crucible when you go into that, that waiting area. And so with Fear Free, what we try and do is, as part of our considered approach, we aim to actually bypass the waiting area altogether. So we can do this through different tactics, like having the person uh, or their pet wait out in the car, so in a temperature controlled car, and then being called in right away for their exam. Uh, this is something too where we may even have different like a back door side door where they can go in rather than having to go through the main area of the lobby if if that's a, a, there's a lot of foot traffic and perhaps that dog or that cat is shy so what we want to do is just minimize any of those triggers for fas and fear anxiety and stress and we also look at things just even when we're looking at visuals we look at things like even the way that we're dressed so rather than having a white smock for instance or um even uh, looking at uh, uh, even patterns on clothing, what we try and do is have have different colors that are aesthetically more pleasing and calming for the pet. So trying to avoid stripes, for instance, and lots of patterns because those actually have been associated, especially in the wild, with um, as a warning signal. So rather than um, you know something that is alarming for that pet, what we want to do is just make it less alarming, more calming for them. So trying to to use those kind of pastel colors, solid colors, and then also looking at things like the footing. So one of the, a big trigger for FAS is when pets are slipping and their paws are slipping out from under them. So uh, Dr. Temple Grandin has talked about uh, how for her, uh, that's really one of the biggest triggers for stress is when a, an animal feels unbalanced. So if they feel unbalanced, they're slipping, that is a huge, huge trigger. So we look at things like having non-slip flooring or non-slip surfaces. So that's where we may use yoga mats, we may use bath mats or uh, like an easy visit pet vet mat that are easy to clean, but that actually provide their paws with more grip. And I found in my okay. experience, especially important with, with some of those bigger dogs, um, like such as uh, Newfoundlands, that, that's usually a really huge trigger for them. 
Mikkel, I might jump in here before we go to the next question. Fear Free is a science-based company. We have a head of research who's a, a boarded veterinary behaviorist, Gary Landsberg. He's boarded uh, American College of Veterinary Behavior and also the European College. Uh, we are funding research. We've funded uh, probably a dozen studies already. I think there's five or six ongoing right now, about half through the American College of Veterinary Behavior, uh, another through uh, the other veterinary schools. I know we've done at least one in Australia, but if you go to fearfreepets.com and go to the research tab, you'll see the research behind. So when we're talking about colors that pets prefer, or we're talking about music and things, this, the science backs it up. So, you know, we, we, and, and Fear Free is not me. You know, I'm a, I had my life changed by that lecture and got it started, but Fear Free is we. There's hundreds of professionals that are part of this group. There's 63 boarded behaviors uh, from the United States, a bunch from the European College, uh, Christy Sexel and others from Australia. There's a bunch of PhD behaviorists, animal handling experts. Mikkel mentioned Pimple Grand, and she's the only person of the whole group that is that is gifted. I mean, unbelievable. Uh, continues to teach us a lot. And in fact, in the coming uh, months here, we're going to take her to a typical veterinary hospital, a typical shelter, a typical training facility, and have her use her superpowers to know exactly what is going on. Thank you both. So how would you reply to industry professionals who claim that they don't really have the time to implement or do fear free? Well, let me start first with, uh, I'll start with the parts that I feel comfortable talking about, which is the veterinary hospital. We know from studies that fear free takes 29 seconds longer. So if you're on a 15 to 20 minute exams, it's going to take you 29 seconds longer, but the exam time is actually better because you're not doing the rodeo, judo, throw, uh, rugby scrum, which would be a great analogy for our friends down in, down in Australia or New Zealand. But instead, it's, you know, the pet is calm. And Fear Free starts at home. When you go to level one Fear Free, the first, the first module is how does a pet owner deliver a calm pet? This doesn't matter if it's to the vet, the groomer, or the trainer. They can't deliver a, a rabid dog, so to speak, and have us wave a stick of pepperoni like a magic wand and, and want them to be calm. So every step of the way, all the stuff about the touch gradient, considered approach, where they wait, what kind of surfaces do they have to get on the table, non-slip for, and everything is designed to keep them at these low levels of FAS. So we measure FAS just like you do for a pain scale or body condition scoring. And in grooming, I tell people, you want to see pets that are, that are fearful, go to watch grooming in these chain stores or give a pet an internasal Bordetella or kennel cough vaccine. That's what it looks like. So when you say you don't have time, what it does is you always, number one, have to put the pet's emotional and physical well-being first and foremost. Two, we don't want to, we don't want to be injured. We don't want the pet to be injured. And it actually, it actually takes it's, it's so, it's a small amount of time. It's literally the same amount of time, but so much more benefit to the pet, the pet owner, the practice and the people. In fact, one of the things I love best about uh, practicing as a veterinarian now, where we embrace fear free at the practice I work at North Idaho Animal Hospital in extreme Northern Idaho, is that instead of a normal veterinary visit where the pet, you drag the, the pet parent, drags the pet into the hospital and then the dog drags them out at warp speed in fear free, the dog drags them into the hospital in warp speed and then the owner has to try to drag it out of the hospital. We call it putting the treat into treatment. So if you wanna, if you want to practice better medicine, if you wanna do a better job grooming or a better job training, and uh, reduce injuries and make more money and have more fun and none of us get in this profession these professions to make life worse for animals then i would encourage you to to be part of fear free and Mikkel, do you want to add anything on the training side so for the trainer course we have a lot on there on cooperative care behaviors so those voluntary behaviors you can teach dogs that are going to benefit the dog uh, or the cat or other animals during different care that they may receive in the home, at the groomer, or at the veterinary hospital. So it really helps to tie all of that together. And we also have training on there on how to work with different veterinary teams. And also 
really looking at those those um, like those respectful boundary lines of being a trainer and being able to work effectively with veterinary professionals. So uh, looking at things like not diagnosing and also being able to have have helpful behavior reports that you can give to the veterinary team. So something like where you can have that communication and that collaboration on different issues that that pet may face, whether it's a behavior issue or it's something specifically related to their care and to fear free. And we have different, different things on there too, like getting them used to general control. So when we look at, so general control is the way that you position a, a patient for care. And uh, general control can be something that you actually would use, uh, the pet owner may use in the home. So they may use some general control techniques to be able to stabilize the dog for a nail trim, for instance, or general control may be used to, to position the pet for having a jugular blood draw. But what we wanna do is we wanna condition the pet to any type of care that they may receive. So a lot of it is really looking at doing this preventively. And also if there is something that that pet is going to be receiving kind of throughout their life or on an ongoing basis, such as, and I know whether it's, I don't know where, you're so cute. Isn't he handsome? Indiana Bones is my love, huh? Uh, so if it's anything that that pet is going to experience, we wanna condition them to that. And one, one such tool that we may use as part of a general control tool is a basket muzzle. And basket muzzles are a really great tool because what it does is it helps to protect really that pet and the entire veterinary team. So we always look at safety, not only of the pet, but also of the vet team, but we also look at emotional well-being. So we wanna ensure that that pet is comfortable and relaxed. And that's where we really wanna condition them to those different tools and get them to willingly wear those. And, and with general control, less is more. So instead of putting on more force of the pet struggles, for instance, we really want to look at, okay, how are we doing on our considerate approach? You know, with general control, maybe we can try different type of handling. Is there a cooperative care behavior we can ask this pet to do? Maybe we need to add in some more uh, food distractions or add in some, uh, some quick desensitization counter conditioning techniques right now. Or a lot of times it's also looking at things like adding in pharmaceutical help or nutraceutical help. And there are stopping points. So with the FAS scale, there are different stopping points where we don't just force our way through care. So we wanna always continually monitor how that pet's doing. And in some cases, it may be better for that pet to come back later. Because once they get in that really, really high state of, of stress in that mother flight mode, we are, are probably looking at doing more damage than we are, do, are doing good. And so many times when that does happen, it's something like mundane care, like a nail trim. And it's never worth compromising that pet's well-being and their ability to receive other types of, of necessary medical care by forcing your way through that. So it's always looking after that pet's well-being and including when we're using towels with cats or if we're using muzzles with dogs. We want to ensure that we are not overlooking that pet's emotional well-being just at, for the sake of getting care done. Yeah, that was excellent. Thank you. So this one is a two-part question. Marty, the first part is going to be for you, and the second part is going to be for Mikkel to actually answer. So Marty, could you please explain the use of PVPs or pre-visit pharmaceuticals within the vet clinic? And then to follow up with that, Mikkel, how would you as a trainer approach a veterinarian to discuss the potential use of PVP for a patient? I realize people probably see me smiling or chuckling here, but I can't quit watching Indiana Bones. Mikkel, you have proven that a man can have only eyes for you. Unbelievable. Uh, I bet everybody out there is getting a, a big kick out of that. Um, just uh, amazing, amazing. Good old Indy Bones. Well, PVPs are pre-visit pharmaceuticals. And you think back of, uh, I think back of my own life and that amygdala would love to remember, forget my mom and dad arguing about getting a divorce when I was a little kid or fights with uh, ex-girlfriends, car accidents, uh, Mikkel having my wife getting a lump in her breast and not knowing what was going on. Mikkel's uh, daughter, our granddaughter Reagan having RSV virus and being in intensive care, but unfortunately it, it can't forget it. Most pets now are sourced at the shelter in the U.S. and we don't know what all has happened in their life. And they can't tell us what happens, unlike humans. You remember, they can't, they don't know why a procedure benefits them. Why does being trained, why does going to the groomer, why is getting vaccinations or having my sore ear or torn nail or laceration or skin issues 
or gums that look like a flamethrower went across it. Why does that benefit me? And they can't anticipate or expect the relief of fear, anxiety, and stress or, or pain, even if it's moments away. So we often start out by doing things that are pretty, pretty generic and work for all, like having the, the, the pet parent get the carrier out a week before, not the morning of or the night before. They preheat or pre-cool the car. They bring the pet in hungry. They start this magic carpet ride of pheromones from carrier to car to clinic. They play a specific kind of, of satellite music on the way in, this calming music. They go check in and go back in the, in the thing and go back out and wait in their vehicle, not in that stew pot of stress called uh, reception area with pets and people they don't know. When they go into the exam room, they are not required to get up on the table. Uh, we avoid direct, eye, <clears throat> avoid direct eye contact and so on. If that doesn't work, then we often go to other things. This can be compression garments like thunder shirts. It can be nutraceuticals like Zilkeen or Anxetane. Um, it can be, you know, warm towels that are impregnated with pheromones. And then if those, we have, remember we have that FAS scale. If we still are too high, then we look at pharmaceutical things. So it can be trazodone, it can be gabapentin, it can be uh, a product, I'm not sure if it's available in Australia. It's a Zoetis product called Celio. It's an oral dexmedetomidine. But there's uh, a wide variety. In fact, on level one fear-free certification, there's two full hours on sedation protocols. And one thing I'd recommend, you don't call them to sedate a pet. You say, we're gonna give it something to calm your pet. And by the way, if they're in the exam room, we, we bring the procedures to the pet. We don't take the pet to the procedures unless we have to take it back to take radiographs or something. Blood draws, catheter placements and everything we try to do in the room. If the pet is better without the owner, the what you should say is, oh, we can tell your pet's very protective of you. It, I think it'd be best if you stepped out for a minute. That's the way you communicate that. But in any given day in a fear-free practice, probably 30% of the pets that come in are on pre-visit pharmaceuticals. And we work, we work hand in hand with the trainer on this. And this is a point, I can give you a specific example. My wife and I, I'll try to give you the, the really short version. My wife and I adopted a emaciated pit bull from a shelter in Louisiana. Once we knew the dog could make it, it had every kind of parasite known to mankind. This dog would bite its own, even though it was almost dead, would bite its own reflection in the stainless steel, try to bite other dogs, would ankle bite the people that worked at the clinic. We worked with a board of veterinary behaviorists and then worked with a fear-free certified trainer. And a year later, that dog is a pooch pacifist that sleeps with his mom in a bed in Virginia while the, uh, the, the husband of the wife sleeps on the floor because it doesn't want to get the dog out of the bed. If without working with the trainer, because you're often the person that we refer to in the practice to work to condition or counter condition pets for visits. So Mikkel, I'll let you answer that second part. So I think as far as PVPs go, so those pre-visit pharmaceuticals, it really does come down to communication and collaboration. So what we wanna do is really work with the pet owner. And so it's really having that open communication with them. So as a trainer, you may work outside of the veterinary hospital or ideally, you actually have established relationships within the clinic. So as an animal trainer, there are different veterinary hospitals that I work um, right in. So North Idaho Animal Hospital, for instance, that's a place that I've, I've been working for, I started puppy classes there years and years ago from when I first started out. And so and that makes it a little bit easier, but regardless of if you're working in the hospital or perhaps you, know, you are in there once a week or even once a month, but just keeping that open communication and that relationship, that way it goes beyond just a business card. I think that as an animal trainer and as a dog trainer, it, sometimes it's just overwhelming to the veterinary team how many trainers there are. Maybe they'll put up your card or your business um, uh, brochure, but it's really hard for them to know what you do and to really have that relationship and that, that open communication. So really working on bettering your relationship with that veterinary team so that way you can have that more direct communication. And one of the benefits of being able to work in the hospital as well is being able to actually have the pets go in for, for what we call victory visits. So victory visits go beyond just the fun visit or the happy visit for pets, uh, which it, if it's 
anything in Australia like it is here in the U.S., a happy visit or a fun visit typically is where the pet goes in and maybe they get a cookie or two from the receptionist and then they leave. And instead of having it be kind of more of a, a generic type of thing, um, even with fun or happy visits, you want to try and improve upon those as well. But victory visits are very, very specific because they are related to specific aspects of care and specific ways or triggers for that pet of FAS. So victory visits, for instance, we may be working on doing a chin rest with a pet to get them to willingly cooperate with blood draws. A lot of pets really panic whenever they um, have any type of restraint or hands on. So that may be something that we're, that we're working with that pet on in something like a 20 to 30 minute type of, of, um, of training session with them. And through that, we can look at, at how that pet's doing. So we have that uh, through the FAS scale, we have a common baseline of communication that we can talk with the veterinary team about. So I can say something, for instance, like the dog came in and he was uh, level two in the lobby and uh, became a level three when he heard dogs barking in the, or heard a dog barking in the back, uh, then settled down into a, a level one FAS. And then uh, what we may do is, you know, if we start to see the pet going into those areas of concern, so with the FAS scale, we have kind of that green zone. So that's usually from level zero uh, up until, um, once you're trying to get it up into level two, you start to go more into in, in going into that yellow zone. So we wanna try and keep that pet low. And then yellow is really kind of that caution, like, okay, we need to really be watching this. We need to potentially take some steps back to get them back into that green, that zero to two. Um, so that's really um, the three to four um, area. And then we have had the red zone, which is um, like the four to five. So um, that's really where, um, you know, we need to stop what we're doing immediately. So um, the, four, um, and the four level is kind of when that pet is like really immobilized in fear, um, is, you know, just kind of all out panic, like um, trying to get away. Or in level five is when they actually are going into aggression. So. Um, we want to be watching that pet the entire time. That's where the FAS scale can be super helpful in being able to communicate with the veterinary team and with the pet owner. So really being able to keep up to date on that pet's progress and being able to communicate with them. Because a lot of times, some of those PVPs, we may need to, uh, or the veterinary team may uh, need to slightly adjust that. So being able to communicate with the veterinarian, this is how the pet's doing. This is about how long it takes them to recover after a period of stress, um, you know, it, and sometimes, you know, they can have some really fast bounce back as well. So um, especially the PVPs can be very, very helpful in just helping to keep those stress levels low and um, being able to help them, yeah, bounce back from a, a moment of stress. And also in communicating with them, we can also help that veterinary team by teaching them the different cooperative care behaviors that that pet has that can help them during care. So during the victory visits, for instance, a lot of times we can actually get the the needed care done right there in session. So it's, it's really having that open communication and that relationship is extremely helpful. Yeah, to, to build off of that actually, what tips do you have for trainers to build those working relationships with their local vet teams? So there are different ways. If, if you don't have a relationship yet with a local veterinarian, it's, it's really finding ways to, to get past um, that, that first person that you may meet when you come in the door. So a lot of times that's where, you know, your stack of business cards or your flyers, it, they may get really kind of stuck at that front desk. So it's really about establishing that relationship with that veterinary uh, team member. So whether it's the uh, one or two veterinarians at the clinic that you have a, a deepened relationship with, uh, some of the technicians or veterinary nurses that you, you develop that deepened relationship with, and some ways to do that that you can consider are doing things like lunch and learns. And you may do a lunch and learn, for instance, on Fear Free. So as a Fear Free certified animal trainer, that would be something I could go in and I could go through with the team different, different training techniques or different handling techniques to minimize stress. Uh, for instance, we can even look at something like nail trims. I, I don't think that there's any veterinary team in the world that wouldn't want more tips on how to help uh, reduce fear, anxiety, and stress during nail trims. And, so that's a really uh, excellent way that you can get really in through those doors to be able to have that closer relationship with the team. You can also do things like giving, giving out some, something like uh, a training course. So they, maybe you send 
of, you know, five different certificates that they can take one of your training courses. So the more that they can actually see you and the type of training that you do and how beneficial it is to, to them and to their pet and to the other pets that are in class, that, that can really be a big sell for them as well. And you can even think about doing things like having puppy classes, or I love how in, in Australia you're so much better about this than we are in the U.S., having those kitten classes and having those in hospital. So not only are we looking at socialization, but we want to look at localization as well. So wherever that puppy or kitten is accustomed to going, that really becomes kind of their comfort zone. And if we can have the puppy or kitten accustomed to the veterinary hospital and to the people there from the very start through those socialization classes, that's extremely beneficial. So one of the best things that you can possibly do for establishing that relationship with the veterinary team and really being able to give back and help pets preventively is through doing those socialization classes. And, and even looking at things like having training in the hospital. So that might be something where there are different uh, peer free certified trainers that I know that will go into a hospital once every week or once a month, perhaps, where they have a day of, of doing different um, training consults or um, they're doing some behavior consulting and really being able to work with that veterinary team. So that's really key. So especially if you have a pet where they may benefit from being on supplements, uh, nutraceuticals, or pharma getting pharmaceutical help, that really helps to have that uh, deepened connection and that, that improved communication of here's where the pet is at, veterinarian gives the, the pet a treatment plan, and then we, we can work with them to develop that training plan to be able to help that pet and really track their progress and, and adjust as, as needed. So being able to have those services in hospital and also doing those victory visits, one of the best ways when I just moved from Seattle to Spokane, but the, one of the clinics in the Seattle area that I worked with, one way that I was able to gain a lot of new clients and also develop a deepened relationship with that clinic was through offering victory visit workshops. So this was for dogs that were one and under. They could sign up to be part of a 15 minute uh, kind of where we had different stations where the dogs could go around with their person and practice different elements of uh, fear-free care. So one station was on the scale, for instance. So teaching the, the dogs to willingly get on the scale. Scales, it may seem surprising to us because especially for those who do dog training, you would think of uh, getting a pet up on a platform, once they, they learn to do that, it's not a problem at all. However, a lot of times pets are drug onto the scales and it's a very, very stressful situation. So if we can teach that pet from the beginning to willingly get on the scale and to actually enjoy being on there, that's gonna reduce a lot of FAS for them in the future. And then the other station was teaching them some, some waiting behaviors, some calm waiting behaviors in the lobby area. So in those situations when perhaps the pet may have to wait for a, a short period, being able to help them learn how to relax and helping them to be accustomed to the different sights and sounds in that lobby area. And then lastly, we had a station right there in the exam room where we would practice different elements of handling, or if the pet already had, had a, a trigger of FAS that they had been uncomfortable with in the past, for instance, um, maybe it was the exam table, um, or maybe it was a different element of handling, we can work with the pet on that. And while we don't a lot of times use the exam table in fear free, most of the time it's really probably gonna be on the ground or perhaps on a person's lap, we still want to try and get them accustomed to those different experiences and try and build those positive, happy, relaxed associations with, with that type of care. So doing the victory visit workshop, it was an excellent way to gain new clients. A lot of the people wanted to take the dog classes after that so that we were able to give them the information for Doggy Haven uh, that I worked with in the Seattle area. And so it, and it really was a win-win for the veterinary team as well. So they were able to offer free service to their clients and their clients were better educated about fear free through that experience. And the pets were much easier for them to work with the next time that they came in. So it's just really neat, just from that one victory visit workshop, for instance, how the pet would come in the next time and they would just leap and bound onto the scale and they were so excited to come in. And so just having those happy experiences, it's beneficial for, for the veterinary team, for the pet, for the pet owner, and really for, for us as the trainer as well. Awesome, thank you, Mikkel. Yeah. Um, Marty, in terms of staff dynamics and communication within a vet hospital, what, what kind of comments or feedback do you have for kind of being the lone ranger, being the only certified, uh, the fear-free certified professional within a clinic? Um, how do you help others get them on board? Oh, mute. 
there's always going to be old school and new school. And so you often, one of the things we do in, in veterinary practices now, ones that are a little more advanced along fear free of have pet owners put down, are there people that they prefer to see or not see? And this is, is there, is there people, their pets prefer to see or not see, or there, are there people, the people prefer to see or not see? And sadly, often you find out the 20 year old veteran veterinary technician that was always the rodeo, judo throw, pilot techs, rugby scrum kind of things are the ones that the pets and the people don't want to see. And you'll have two different things. One is you'll have pet owners that just want you to get stuff done. Like when you, when you embrace fear free, you will have a certain percentage of people that will leave the practice. We've had quite a few of them come back. But when you don't hold a dog down to do a nail trim, when you don't hold a dog down to clean their ears out when they're struggling and think they're going to die, you'll have some people that say, oh my God, Doc Blank did it for years. I've never had a dog that we've had to give something to comma to trim their nails and I don't care if you hold it down. And it has to be part of a culture change where you say, listen, we don't do that anymore. And we don't do ear, uh, you know, ear trims on dogs, uh, on Dobermans anymore. We don't, uh, declaw cats, we don't do convenience euthanasia, and we're not going to traumatize a pet. In fact, I'll tell a pet owner if they're really struggling, Michaela talked about this earlier, if they're really struggling, we'll say, listen, I'm not going to, I'll say, I'm not going to sacrifice your pet's long-term emotional well-being for the convenience of getting this done today. We have three options. One, we can retreat, come back another day a different way. And that may be adding a thunder shirt or pre-visit pharmaceuticals. We uh, can give it something orally and wait for it to take effect, or we can go straight to something IV uh, to calm your pet. So, in, and I've seen this inside of veterinary schools, I've seen it inside of veterinary nursing schools, where now a newer generation that realizes what you're doing to this pet, here it is at level four, level five, thinking it's going to die, and you continue to stretch a cat out into two postal codes or have four people hold it down, the trauma that never leaves that pet. It not only doesn't want to go back to the vet or go back to the groomer, or go back to the trainer, it has uh, more generalized problems. So I think it's, uh, it's part of a culture change. Sometimes I've seen people, uh, a single person be able to change a practice or change a grooming facility where they said, you know, it's hard enough to change yourself, let alone change other people. So they modeled what they wanted to see done and eventually it changed. And other times I would just tell you, if you can't change uh, the practice or the business, you might change the practice or business that you work at. Yeah. Are there any final thoughts or pearls of wisdom that either of you want to share, uh, regardless of which, which certification program we're talking about or Fear Free in general? Well, one thing I want to offer to anybody, uh, I realize we uh, are running a little short of time. Uh, I'm going to give my my email address uh, on air here, and we'll make sure that it's, it's put up as well, but it's drmjb at fearfreepets.com, drmjb at fearfreepets.com. And I'm sure Michaela give hers as well, but we want to be able to help you continue through this journey. You know, we're we're far along here, and it's amazing if you see it where now there's, there's areas in the United States, many areas where the veterinarian works with the trainer, works with the groomer and works with boarding. They all report back. we all have hands on this pet, the physical and the emotional well-being of the pet. You see something in the pet that you think it may be, because a lot of these issues are pain related, or we see something in the veterinary thing that we need to condition or counter condition the pet or have the kind of behaviors that are, uh, you know, help it live a happy, healthy, full life, or the groomer sees some kind of issue and they just send a picture to the vet and the vet does it. And luckily technology is catching up too, to where we have some platforms uh, to be able to connect all these people together. But uh, we're really excited about what we've seen. Uh, I've been in 89 countries and Australia is one of my favorite places on earth. And, and we certainly don't need to teach you anything about the human animal bond or about the shelter community, but we really welcome uh, the gifts that you can add to this growing bodily and knowledge that we can do to help not just pets, but all animals live happy, healthy, full lives. One last thing, make sure if you have your shelters down there, have them go to fearfreeshelters.com. It's complimentary to all shelter and rescue groups and send your uh, clients and your friends and anybody to fearfreehappyhomes.com. There's absolutely no charge for it. 
and together uh, we'll each achieve more. And then I just wanted to give my email out. So if you want to reach out to me as well, if you have any training related questions or a question on how you two can get a dog as cute as Indiana Bones, then my email is mikkel.becker at fearfreepets.com. So you spell that M-I-K-K-E-L dot Becker, B-E-C-K-E-R at fearfreepets.com.